Hello and welcome to another edition of Extra Connections here on JLJ Media, my online network. And who am I? I am James Law Jr., the JLJ of JLJ of JLJ. I will say that 10 times because it's my own network. So this person is related to many guests I've had on this show and other shows. And he's also a junior. I'm going to ask him a question about that. Um, this He's an actor, but this but here's the thing that's happening. That I'm so happy to hear this. They're called Brothers of the Desert. And they're putting on this annual night of storytelling, which I, oh my God, I love this kind of stuff, um, called Brothers Got Talent. And so he's one of the performers that's going to be there doing this at the Palm, which I think is all correct, at the Palm Springs Cultural Center, Camelot Theater Lounge in Palm Springs. I'll put in the links below where you can go and, and go check if you want to go check that out. It's Saturday, May 21st. So it's coming up, folks. It is coming up. But Brothers Telling Stories, I love it. I'm all in for that. But you've seen all kinds of shows. You're like, it's that guy in that thing. Yes, it is. It is Ralph Cole Jr. Hello, Ralph. Hello, James Lott Jr. Thank you so thank you so much for inviting me to laugh and play with you today. Yes, thank you. So we're both juniors. And yes. I, always, I ask every single this, I ask this question of every single junior, and I get all kinds of answers. So I'm asking the same question, Ralph. What does a junior mean to you? Great question. A junior means I am a blessed subset of my father. And I am a miniature version of him in the sense that he was always my great daddy and I was his baby boy. So for me, the junior, it's a nice, as my father always said, he handed the baton off to me. So I've taken the baton and I'm going forward. It, the, the buck will be stopping with me, but I have honored his name and I'll continue to honor it. So for me, I'm a, I really am a chip off the old block. You know, doesn't, apple doesn't fall far from the tree type of man. No, I, so what you said, I actually have said before myself that I am an extension of James Lott Sr. I'm a continuation of James Lott Sr. Um, you know, parents always want their kids to do better, have more opportunity. Um, you know, my father grew up in Louisiana, Creole boy, whole thing, worked very hard, two, three jobs to raise the kids. Um, and so I had to do that, thank God. So I had a, a, a different experience. Um, so like you, I feel the same way. I feel like it's an extent to carry on. It's the book starts with me here also will be a Thursday that I know of. That I know about there. Okay. Uh, allegedly, uh, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Yeah, I, I was <laughs> wild there in my twenties. Who knows? Um, no, but I, but I feel like you. And so it's funny you just said that. I feel the same. I feel like you're saying because why well, ask that question, Ralph? Because some for some people have answered it. It was an albatross. It was. Mm. I don't have. I can't find my own identity because I'm a genius. Oh. That's why I always ask that question. I get very different answers from everybody. That's, I just got goose pimples. That's so funny. It, it, I never, like, albatross is the furthest thing from my mind. But when you just said that, I can understand why somebody could feel that way based on the relationship they had with that parent. You know, now, is a daughter a junior? If it's, yeah, yeah, they can be. They can be. Okay. It's rare, but it can happen. I see, because I, um, like I said, my father was a prominent physician. He taught me well. And like you said, we are extensions of that. And that extension doesn't mean that we have to duplicate our fathers. The extension, it's like whenever you eject something and, and put it out there, it's like, how will it fly and how will it go? And that's what our fathers did for us. You know, they had their sons. I'm an only child also. And he, my parents had me. And um, yeah, I'm so proud. I love I'm Ralph Cole Jr. Daddy and I are totally different. He was a prominent physician. I am an actor. He was a, very much the ladies' man. I play ladies' men on TV <laughs> and film. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and I also want to add that my mother, Rose, is from Ruston, Louisiana. You know, you know we're, we're related probably. That's how, that's okay. How. You know, at some point, and my father's from Reading, Pennsylvania. Oh, funny. Okay. Wait, wait, sorry. Yes, my, my father's from Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. His brother is from the, the, it's from the Cane River up there in some small village. 
So I know, I know, I know, and actually, I know what rest. I know rest in Louisiana, so I do. Know okay. It, um, I do. Yeah, and I and I can remember Shreveport because they're they're like sixty miles. I I don't know exactly the distance, yeah. but they're close enough that we both know what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I was gonna say, you just brought up something else. We are parts of our mother also, so that's like, I try to tell people: don't feel like an albatross because you have your father's name. But remember, you're also part of your mother. You may have his name, but you know, there's, there's also that chicken in there too. Oh, no, absolutely. I'm totally, in fact, well, we'll talk about this. The show that I'm doing is about me being a feminine all my life. And well, how let's, that, let's, get, let's, get, well, let's get to that right now, then. That, is that the story? That's, that's the story you're going to talk about. Okay, well, thank you, James. It's, I've it titled the storytelling, the umbrella title is Make Me Masculine. And when you own something, as you know, you diffuse it if what you're owning has been an albatross in your life that people have tried to label you. And growing up, it was a sensitive, hard thing. Sissy, effeminate, you act like your mother, you act like a girl. It, that was all through my life. So growing up, I was fine. And my, and my parents were always supportive to me. My father is very, was very masculine. He accepted me. But in my mind, I always felt I need to be more masculine. I can't let them know that I'm effeminate or that I'm gay, I, you know. And as I did that through life, I was stilted. And I wasn't living my full self that I knew was in me. I've always been a free, fun spirit. So growing up, having those expletives hurled at me as sensitive as it was, it's made me a fearless human being today. So rather than trying to repel it or get upset because somebody back in my life called me a sissy, I own it because it's like, you know what? You're right. I was and I am. And as I, I, as I say in my show, James, I, <clears throat> as you know, Parents from our generation, and not just our parents, save letters and save lots of things. And as a, as a precocious child, I found one of these letters going through things. And it was a letter from my fourth grade teacher to my father, explaining to him that everybody here at school thinks your son is effeminate. And this does not necessarily mean that he's a homosexual, um, but I just thought I would bring that to your attention. And when I first discovered it and read this, I thought, God, why would he say that to my father? And, and how must that have made my father feel? And did my father ever share that with my mother? And then I, I changed. I reread the letter and I thought, yes, I am a feminist. This does not necessarily mean that a person is homosexual. Right. Mm, really? No, I want that to be that way. I, I like know, right, that. Right, right. And so, the point of all of that, James, is rather than reading that letter, being upset with this reverend who took it upon himself, feeling that he owed our race something to explain this to my father, I moaned and it was like, you know what, Reverend Schmidt, you're right. I was effeminate and I did turn out homosexual and I'm fabulous. Well, you know, what you, I, just, I, wanna, I wanna pack 10 things you just said in there. Um, that I just, I agree with so much. First, number one, I think anyone who is effeminate, whether they're gay or straight or any other in between, is brave, first of all. I think much braver than a masculine person. I mean, much braver. I just do. When you walk to earth, fully who, yourself, who you are, and you're not the hyper-masculine person out there, and I put it in air quotes for those who are listening to this, um, I think you're brave. I think it's. I think it's. It's, well, it's a wonderful, brave thing that I think should be should just be celebrated, just be and just be recognized. Thank Two, you. our community, and when I say that, black, our black folks, um, the whole male thing, being a black man, we have that too. So I tell people, you know, there's several layers to us because we're 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 gay, we're black. There's two things going on. The society's already coming at you for the black thing. They see that. Then within the black community, there's the whole 
gay thing or the effeminate thing, like you're not hood enough or street enough, not realizing you can be hood and street and still be gay. That's another story. That's all another story too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? So I, I think I think you touched on a bunch of a bunch of things that where it's like you yourself and others like you have had to fight these different things just to be be just to be yourself. Like you had that's and that has to give you some kind of thick skin, um, war wounds, whatever you want to call them. But oh, just like absolutely, I yeah, I just I'm getting chills based on what you're saying. You're absolutely right. All those different layers and the racism and prejudice within our race, and we see that with just not our black culture, but every every gay culture, our gay culture, we do it. You know, um, the, yes. you know, there's so yes. much dissension, and that's just human nature. You know, I want to share something with you, and this please, could be deemed please. politically <clears throat> incorrect, but I never worry about that. Um, it's based on what you were saying about the we're gay and we're black, and now we're the gay part. Are we are we masculine enough? Are we black enough? Yes, yes. I in the year two thousand, I was in Staten Island, and. I've been in Staten Island twice in my life, and both times, not the best experience. But the experience I'm referring to now, I had gone to my friend's Sweet 16 birthday party, and I was now waiting for the bus in the wee hours, like at two in the morning, and wasn't thinking of anything. I mean, yeah, I, it wasn't like I was this waiting for the bus. I was the only person there. I don't know where I am. I just know catch the M32 to oh, get yeah. to oh, yeah. this ferry or whatever I need yes. to, to get off this island. Yes. And a truck goes by with all these white guys in the truck, pickup truck, and they scream, nigger! And I was shocked because my first reaction was, oh my God, this is the year 2000? Like, I'm so naive, right? And they're still saying that in 2000? Right, all right. But then my next thought was, oh, thank God it wasn't faggot. Because wow. the, what, the way I grew up when guys would say, faggot, faggot, I always resented that. It's like, well, how do you know? Like. Yes. I don't have a penis in my mouth and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's, you know, it's like, right. I get you saying, and yeah. you said it earlier too, a, a man can be effeminate and straight, mm -hmm. you know, but unfortunately our society never looks at it that way. So the thing that was politically incorrect, it's like, Oh, so you'd rather be called an N word rather than a fag. And I, it made me laugh at that moment because as they drove by one, they're not circling back to beat me up. Yeah, yeah. And two, it's like, thank you for not saying faggot because right. I, you know, but like for me, them calling me that was like, duh, you know, it, it's like, yes, I am a black person. But when you say faggot, when you're standing at the bus stop, it's like, really? How did you get that? See, you I, get what you're, I get what you're saying. I think anybody black and gay will get what you're saying. I think I think I think it would be politically correct for folks who are possibly white and gay would think that or or straight. But I think if you're black and gay or black and lesbian or black, I think you would get. I think we get what you're saying. I totally get what you're saying. I completely get it. It's it's still kind of fucked up on some level, right? But it's kind of like this weird reality that we live with every day because there's two sides. We just it's just it's just a it's a dual reality that. Right. And it's something that I haven't worn as a burden on my shoulders throughout. But like you're saying, it's something that I am subconsciously aware of. I am conscious to this day of it's a second thought. It's not the primary thought, James, or the primary observation. But at some point during the course of the time I'm wherever I am, yeah. oh, I'm the only black person. Okay. Oh yeah! Oh, oh yeah. Doing, and you know, just as recently as the other night, like I went to see. I'm starting to uh, try to enter society a little yeah, bit yeah, more, yeah. still very safely. So I went to some theater. Um, I went to see Wanda Sykes. At oh, the I love her. Oh my God, she was so funny. But that's just a tangent. But yeah. The the two one person shows that I went to. It was the Black Box Theater 
in yeah. Los Angeles, and you know how that is, you know, small 99 seat theater. Oh, yes, we love those. I love oh, those. Oh, yeah. please, no, that's, I'm going to be performing in them. And, 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 and have. And yeah, have, yes, you me know, too, I have me a, too, so yes, I Okay, know. I have a whole experience of doing that. And um, I just, you know, and it wasn't, like I said, I do not go through life with that. Right now, I get you that. know. I really get it. But sitting in the audience, I just realized, and of course I'm sitting in the back because I'm thinking, no, James, because that's just less people breathing on the back of my neck. I know, I know but it's, it's funny, when we go to the back of anything, it's like you, you, you kind of immediately think, of course, on the back of it. I mean, I can stop here if I want to. No, yeah, okay, no, I, okay, well then I have to go off on this tangent with you. When you I love it, you I love it, said, please, please. That shit is so funny, what you just said. Okay, so I'm sitting in the theater, and I'm realizing, just, you know, I, like I said, it's not a conscious observation, like, okay. Right, right, right. I'm like, but I notice, oh, well, I'm the only black person here. Okay, fine. Okay, I've got to tell you this, which you just said about, okay, if we go to the back of anything, it's immediately like, mm hmm. Yeah, oh, we, do, and we do. I said, we do. I'm like, I, I do. Right, okay, let me share this with you and tell me what your experience okay. is. Okay. You're the only black or very few minority black people at a white person's function yes. where fried chicken, potato salad, beans, biscuits, and watermelon are being served at the buffet. Yes. And as you're going down the line, now, when I see fried chicken, I almost black out, okay? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. going... So you're going down the line. Yes. You know, getting your 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 little things, and you look at that chicken, and you're thinking, "Damn, if I get some of this chicken, they're all gonna be like, well, of course you got the chicken.' You know, <laughs> you can't help but think that it's so yes. fucked up. Like yes. even food is fucking like yes, you yes, know, like it, yes. it's political. And as I told one of my relatives years ago, I said, "God." If we can't even sit out here on our porch comfortably and eat a rind of watermelon, because if the wrong person passes by, it's like, okay, there you have it. You know, and I'm not talking about eating the watermelon with the- Oh, I know, uh, I know. No, uh, it's I know. like a slot, uh-huh, uh-huh. So I'm like, but you know, so I had to bring that up because that's so funny to me. It's just like, you know, so let me get some grapes and some, uh, what would be a white food? I guess some like- Chicken Parmesan or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, something like that. Some some shrimp scampi or something. I don't know, shit, I don't know. Some, like some, that. some pate with some crackers, just something. I'm like, I want that fucking chicken. Yes, okay. I'm getting me that watermelon to wash it down. And yes, I want those beans. And that biscuit too, God damn it. Okay, exactly. I mean, which reminds me, this is so funny to laugh with you like this. I love it. When I was at my neighbor's repast and we're all eating and you know how repasts are, especially a black, it's just like, yes. and I was sitting there just to eating and there was just ribs and pork and chicken and we were all, and I was like sucking on this bone, right? And you know, of course, I want to go, James, like this. Oh, this pork is to die. Oh, I guess that would be inappropriate. Yes. And one woman goes by and she goes, Oh, please, honey, it is not a bereavement unless there is pork. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, later in the party, um, the host insisted I take home. A big old bag of that okay. Albertson's fried chicken that was okay. left over. Okay. Right. My mother and I totally enjoyed that. Oh, you know, I have no shame. So my I have I have um, a sister there, she's married to a huge Mexican family. So they're they're similar to black folks in many ways. But it's funny. So one day I couldn't make it to a function. I had to work. I I, I had to do it. I had to do some shows or whatever. But I live two blocks away. So James Law Jr. grabbed a Tupperware bag, uh, thing and went over there, walked in, hi, everybody, grabbed some food, put it in Tupperware, see you guys next time, and left. And they couldn't stop laughing. They were like, James K. brought his black ass in here with his Tupperware 
and got his plate. I got a plate or two and then left. That's okay. what we do. That's what we do. I, I was okay. laughing the other day because I was remembering this. It's funny much in Waterbound. So, ironically, folks, this is not even a joke. I'm allergic to watermelon. Ah, uh, no. We all have our bugaboos. It's just like when people are like, I can't eat chocolate. I was like, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, sorry sorry for you, right? Sorry for yeah, you. Yeah, what a life you have. Yes. But, oh, my God. That, your stories, we are so similar about things. That is, yes. yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and, my, and my little last story about watermelon is, so there was my, I had two white roommates. We lived in San Francisco near the Castro, and there's a big Safeway that's there on Market Street. So everybody in San Francisco knows where it is. Um, and so I was, so one of us will stop after work. I take the, I take the Muni, which is the above ground thing. And I, and I get off and I, so I'm going to stop it. I call home and stop in Safeway. Do anybody need anything? <laughs> Cause my one white roommate's from the South. And so they eat everything we eat down there and say, so whatever. He's like, can you grab me a watermelon? And I said, I am as a black person in San Francisco, I am not going to grab a watermelon and walk it down the street with this thing home. And he laughed. We laughed so hard on that one. He'll never forget that. I said, no. Now, if we buy something else to go to the watermelon, maybe. I'm not just going to go there and buy a watermelon and carry it down the street just like chickens. Like, you know, no, we're not oh, doing it. Oh, please, James, don't be carrying that watermelon. Here, you're sure I need to put that watermelon on top. Hey, there you hey, you're and, and, and and that's right. balance, balance that shit like you're an African woman in Liberia, girl. <laughs> now, listen, let me just tell you, Good. OK. Jasper will be watching this at some point. And, Hi, Jasper. You know, Jasper knows okay. I love him. He knows I love him, so I love Jasper. I watched the show that you did with Jasper. That was the one I, you know, I sat and act, watched in, in, in its entirety. We have this running joke about, um, well, two things. One is boomerang, meaning that I bring everything back to me. So whenever we would have guests on the show, no matter what was said, it'd be like, oh, God, I remember that now. What happened to me was, so it just became a big joke. And Jasper would tease all our guests and be like, okay, here we go. Ralph is going to do his boomerang. And sometimes when I don't do it, when we get off air, Jasper was like, I can't believe you didn't say anything when so-and-so said. I said, I know. I was different. I was doing something different. How about that? <laughs> but, but regarding the Tupperware, the big joke between Jasper and me, and this was before the pandemic, whenever I went on a set, I took Tupperware with me because they can't give that leftover food to the homeless That's because right. of the health department. Yes, you're right. So unfortunately, you it you'll out. see vats of just really good food going into the trash can. I would bring that Tupperware just like you did at that party, and I would fill that shit up. Yep. And um, if they had refrigeration, I would do that. If not, I'd put it in my car and hope for the best. Yes. And he always teased me about that. It's like you and Rosie Perez go to the set with Tupperware. And I was like, well, why not? I can get two more meals out of this. Okay. Thank you. you. Thank you. Grocery's great. And I always laugh because you and Jasper are the same last name. You guys ever play on that? Well, the only play on that is that we say that we're brothers from a different mother, and we've had to qualify it of people that had thought we were related or oh, when wow. they haven't seen us together. Even the other day, I did an interview, and a picture of Jasper and I came up. And this is what's so funny, James. Years ago, somebody said, oh. <laughs> told Jasper he looked like Cat Williams. Oh, my God. We laughed so oh, hot. You had to leave the screen for that one. Yeah, I did. We laughed, we laughed so hard at that that so every now and then, you know, just when we're playing around, I'll be like, oh, you know, it's Cat Williams is doing a show now. He just did a show. I was like, so when the pic, the photo of the two of us came up, I said, oh, well, you see, we could be brothers. You just, you know, especially in our day and age, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. with biraciality. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. But no, it's just a coincidence that we have the same name. Right. So I want to actually ask you a little more about the, the story you're telling at this at the uh, Brothers Got Talent. So how you? So what were you asked to put it to write it, put it together? Is this like, is this almost like a mini one man show because it's, it's storytelling? So please yes. explain. Please explain. Yeah. <clears throat> well, last year in November, I had the pleasure of working with Lorenzo Taylor and Yvonne Jordan, who are members of Brothers of the Desert. Yvonne and I have known each other for 20 years. I'm a, a new friend of Lorenzo. And 
Lorenzo wrote this very poignant play that's told in prose and poetry where he highlighted James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Essex Hemphill, E. Lynn Harris, and Terrell McRaney. And each actor portrayed these activist poets, writers. Okay. And it was a successful evening, it was a two act play. And as a result of that, Lorenzo invited me to become, to be a part of the storytelling. And because he knew I had, had some stand up experience before, and just because of my personality, he said, I'm sure you have a lot of funny stories, and which I do. So I thought, yeah, so that, that's my invitation to coming to Brothers of the Desert. And he explained to me, you'll have, um, it's conversations with Ralph Cole and uh, there are other people performing. Michael, uh, uh, Michael Q is performing and Antonio Lamans is performing um, and then myself. So with the umbrella of comic storytelling is how I came up with my Make Me Masculine. And I had had other titles or other focuses. I had, I had first started because my life has been being effeminate and not being black enough. And I first started the show about not being black enough, but realized more of my life has been about being effeminate. And then that not being black enough came up too. And the first time I was really exposed to that was in high school, Beverly Hills High School the white high school, but the racism was from the black students. And my mother, in the district where we live here in Los Angeles County, Windsor Hills, Baldwin Hills View Park, she I'm didn't right want near me. You. I'm, in, I'm in Inglewood, right near you. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Well, my grandmother lived in Inglewood and my uncle. Yes. And I'm in Inglewood, I go to my, I go to Costco, Inglewood. Yes. And and now I get COVID tested at the CVS on Century on the break. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that, that CVS is where I get my, my prescriptions. So yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we know where we are. And, um, you know, my grandmother was off of Arbor Vita, yeah. you know, so my, my uncle on 79th. So yeah, I, you know, you and I are adjacent to each other. We'll probably see each other now at Costco, right? Yeah, yeah see, that's, and, that's, uh, that's, I, I was just going to say that. Now that we've said this, I'm going to run into you. I just know I am. And so, um, yeah, so I am, I, I, what was I saying about, like? No, I got so, I got so into where you're from, I go, because look, because you, you grew up, because you grew up in this, because you had the white high school, but oh, you had right. the racism from the black folks. Right, from yes. Park, Baldwin Hills, yeah. Yeah, and I was saying how my mother didn't want me to go to the all black high school. Crenshaw, Crenshaw, Crenshaw. yeah, but Crenshaw. Crenshaw. Uh-huh, Crenshaw would be my district. Yeah. And, um, and Dorsey is here too, is down right. on Obama Boulevard. But yeah, yeah. I think Krisha is in one of my districts. And my mother was a school teacher also. And she was like, I want Ralphie to have a different experience and different it was. I had a great time in high school, but in addition to the femininity, now we were adding, you're not black enough either. Yeah, yeah, because I was, I was uh, when I came up, it was a long time ago, um, I was in, a, so when I went to school, I was tested, so I ended up going to La Tierra, going to La Dara. Uh, and back then, we were the first, actually, seventh, eighth grade class. We, it, was, it was K through six. But we, we extended it. So and I didn't want to go because where I live is Inglewood High School, which I ended up going to Inglewood High School. But I didn't want to go there. I want to go to Westchester or another one. But I mean, it, it's fine, whatever. But and folks, you, know, you understand this stuff. It's just this. Ladera Heights is another upscale, blackish you know, neighborhood also. Um, but anyway, so but with La Tierra, that was interesting because at La Tierra, I was accepted for who I was. Back in the hood, we get bus back to Setonella, and I'd be back in my neighborhood in Inglewood, and it was like, "You talk white, you sound white, you're vanilla." And actually, I do have white folks in my back. I do have some in my fat background, but it was like, "No, I mean, I am black." I was like, "I, I look like you. I have a big nose. And I, I saw all these things with a kid. Like, I look like you." The police still stopped me, also. <laughs> um, but that's, but I understand the whole thing. Or my friends would tell me. I don't think of you as black. And I used to think that was a badge of honor at first when I was young. Mm. I, I'm thinking, oh, they're thinking of me as James. Oh, okay. No, that's not what it was. Because the only the folks that said that, they were saying, as they say now, you were not invited to the cookout because you're not black. You don't, you don't sag your pants or talk a certain way. Or it's like, oh, that's what that means. So I started, so like you, I had realizations 
And that's the one thing I had to reconcile because I was a naturally overachieving, smart person, but I was also popular. I was one of everybody. I knew everybody to, to this day. It's how my life is. I knew everybody because mm-hmm. I was always a jokester. I was always very friendly, um, but I wasn't one of those snobby, popular people that I knew them who came from the doctors and the lawyers, the Ladera Heights at the top, or Baldwin Hills at the top, or they would be in, you know, oh, and I, I not, you know, I, I knew those folks. Um, and so folks you'd understand is uh, Baldwin Hills is called the Black Beverly Hills. It's a, it's a whole, it's a, it's, it really isn't, it's beautiful, I mean, it's beautiful up there, it's really up there, there's million dollar homes, but, you know, I'm down in Lamert Park, I'm down here with the folks down, down the hill, over there, my grandmother was on, you know, Bridehurst at 54, I mean, I, mean, I knew all this stuff, so I mean, like, I knew the area, but I knew the richer, upper class Blacks who were first, mostly came from first generation Baldwin Hills folks, first generation Ladera. Their parents were the first Blacks to move on that street. Exactly. You know that, you know about that. So it's like one of those kind of things where it's like, but then they were passing down some of the elitism to those of us who just didn't come from that. I didn't come from that. My parents were rich or anything. They were, they were working and trying to get it done, but it was just really, I, I know what you mean. So it's kind of the whole not being black enough, not being this enough, being the only black in the room. I've been the first black this. I've been the only black that. I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, and yeah. like some, you said earlier, same thing. I think all of us black folks naturally survey the room for a second to see anybody like us. It's like a quick little, it's like it's quick. It's, about, it's quick. I just kind of took a little survey. Like, e, 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 e. There's one. Okay, got it. Uh, 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 one over there. Okay, got it. That's it. Yeah, and the, and to your point, it's kind of like what you were saying about when people say, "Oh, well, we don't think of you as black." It's not that I didn't think of myself as not black. I just forgot that. Oh, my color is different. Like, yeah, it's always second nature. Like, oh, I'm a black person here. Should I, was I too pushy? Or I, I never think like that. I'm just Ralph, you know. Yeah. So I know what you're saying. But and and to your point, you know, I. It's inter- It's important that our audience knows that you and I are not walking in every situation like how many black people are there yeah, exactly, one, two, exactly, it's right. not that but it's it's no different than if you walk into a room and you were the only man yeah, you know the true, only true. visible man you'd be like oh god okay this am i in the right room because these are all women you exactly know, type, you know so um it Unfortunately, I mean, things have gotten better, but I was going to say, unfortunately, is it ever going to change, James? No. Is it ever? I mean, we are human beings. And after I saw how, how one, human beings voted for our government and how human beings acted during a fatal pandemic, I thought there's no hope for any of us until... I mean, you. I mean, let me backtrack. There's hope for all of us, but what I mean to say is, it's every man for himself, and there are still beautiful people in the world and in our society. But when I saw in mass things that I thought would be an obvious, like we're going to squelch this, right, we're right, not going right. to do something that stupid, that careless, that irresponsible for a nation. When that's all allowed to happen and that we have to live through it, then it's like, wow, thank goodness I don't have a young child I'm trying to teach how to maneuver through just these inequities. Yeah. Um, I also, side I want to mention, two things I want to ask you about. One side I want to ask you about, um, I, I do a lot of shows, I, I call them Extra Connections, Black Talk or Race Talk. I talk about, I bring people on who are Black, we talk about Black things. But you mentioned, you are mentioning some names from this, this show you did. And, you know, I'm like, yes, at 6 Hemp Bell, like, these are names I talked about. No one talks about Elin Harris that much. And I'm like, I was wondering what your thoughts on that. I, I'm wondering, if because he was a, a fiction writer, I mean, was, I wonder why I'm talking about him as much as some of the others you just mentioned. I mean, the others were, I mean, because he did romance. I mean, I was wondering why, why am I talking about Elin Harris more? I, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's... Yeah. Um, and the same uh, sometimes with Essex also. Um, That's true. No, you're right. I, true, yes. No, no. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, we, every, and even Terrell, you know, like 
people may not know his name right of Langston Hughes and James Baldwin were so yes. prolific and so publicized. That's yeah. why we know those names. And I think because Elon Harris did some very um, uh, revolutionary things as right. well, selling right. his own right. books and things. And yeah, that's an interesting question. Why didn't he rise up to that same? Why is it's his? It's funny because you'll hear like, you'll hear you know, Zora, of course, you'll hear her name. There's even people I've heard people talk about Zane recently. And I'm like, wow, I haven't heard that name in a while. And there was a lot of romance, erotic right. kind of things. Like, but I'm like, I'm not hearing Elin Harris. I'm just, I'm just thinking, why am I not hearing his name bandied about in certain circles either? I'm just wondering. I mean, yeah. he, he, had, he, did, he had a lot of books also. He had, he had books also out there, but he was like working it out. Right, right. Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, yeah. why Why is he the more obscure one? You yeah, know, it's, it's, what, it's just, just a thought. I'm just not saying you might as well. You just like, oh, I heard the name in a long time. I've mm -hmm. never heard that. Um, you know, we got we got to protect our artists, folks. You got to protect our right, artists. exactly. Well, thank Lorenzo Taylor for that. Yeah. Because, well, yeah. you know, he brought him to the limelight in this play and, and, and uh, allowed his voice to be heard. I'm saying that's what it is nowadays. I'm so happy when I see young black or young Latinx or young queer discover something mm -hmm. and I, I mentor a lot of them, they'll tell me, have you heard about my, uh, yeah, I was there, I was there at the premiere. <laughs> now, my wife's like, that's how old I am. I'm like, yeah, I know, I was there at the premiere, I know. But like when they discover it with glee and their eyes are opening, I'm just like, I remember, I remember a bunch of my, my, my kids were like, I, I saw this thing called uh, Tongues Untied. I'm like, Okay, let me talk about that. That was my man. I was all into you know, That was one of the rare things you ever saw for a black person on TV. Like I had to do the history for them. I'm like, I was there, and like you guys, and so you guys are finally discovering him. I was like, good. So I'm like, so it's kind of like I'm always like, protect the arts, protect the black arts, protect the black queer arts, protect. We got it. We got. We got to keep talking to these people out because I don't want them to kind of die out. I mean, they they built <laughs> us. Right, exactly. The history will always be there and will always move that history forward. Yeah. But I feel that because unfortunately the world is just filled with so many people that yeah. don't believe that, you know, that's what we constantly have to maneuver through. And it's now, you know, again, I'm not going to the supermarket or the CVS every day, you know, being all like, who's out to get me? It can, we, you heard what just happened in Buffalo, New York. Well then, and then what just happened here in Orange County? You know, so it's always like, which group, you know, right. which group is next, you know, and, and how do you avoid it? And, and how can you predict that this person is gonna go off like that? You know, it's, um, yeah. We each have to just live as purely as possible and really hope for the best. That's true. Now, I want to ask you your, your thoughts on the word queer. I just talked with some people on the show recently of different generations. You know, our generation, that was a word we did not say because that was used against us. So now it's been reclaimed. And I'm fine with it now, but I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm fine with the young kids. They want to do that. So what are your thoughts on, on the, the word queer? Um, for me, it still reeks... It, 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 like you said, in the time we were growing up, it still had a negative connotation, like the N word. So I haven't really absorbed it into my my vernacular. Okay. I'm more comfortable with gay because gay, for me, is, is in in usual parlance was happy and lively, and that's what I am. So that's why I align myself with gay. There's a, in Carmen, the opera, there's some lyrics where they say, queer people passing to and fro, queer people passing. And when I used to hear that, I, it never dawned on me that they were talking about gay people. They were talking about strange people, bizarre people oh, got it. as the queer people. And now in our vernacular with us being the LGBTQ and, the, and we, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. I understand it's a word we've owned. And like I said at the beginning, it's a word that we've diffused. So we can use it proudly and call ourselves that. For me, myself, it's not a word that I use. Yeah. So that's why I haven't accepted it into my yeah. vernacular. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. All right. So... How do you keep you, how do you, in terms of artists, not just so the artist side of you, we've done all this other stuff, but in, in the core of all this stuff, you're an artist. So you're, you're an actor, you're an artist, you're a storyteller, all these things. So how do you, how long have you been in the business? How, how long, what was the first thing you did professionally and how long have you been in the business? Well, 
I'd like to say at 21, when I moved to New York, is when I was pounding the pavement, trying to do any and everything. And between, at 21 years old, so that would have been like 1979 or 1980. Um, I, I attribute, I, I always say 2004 is when I really started my, my TV work going forward. But before 2004, I did a, so much other stuff. I did lots of theater and I did do other TV things and film as well all before that. But 2004, it, it was after my father had passed away where I really looked at, net, it, it was really, my start of doing network TV and getting studio film when I could and more network TV and stage plays along the way. But well before 2004, I, I was born performing. So if you just wanna say the Easter pageant, James, okay? I was at the East, you know, doing the Easter pageant. So, um, you know, I've always been a born performer. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and I'm grateful that I've been able to stay in the business and do all that, you know, with the help of my parents and through opportunity. So, but I, I, it's a great question and I'll have to remember how to answer this in the future because 2004 isn't when I started. No, not at all. But, but 2004 is when I had that network show and let me know that whether I'm effeminate, whether I'm not black enough, that's all out the window now because producers have hired me to be on an NBC show. Yeah. And because I've done that a number of times throughout my career, that's what I want to impart also. Once I owned one left, once I stopped going to interviews, trying to be like, hi, my name is Ralph Cole Jr. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. And then leave the interview like, oh God, I hope they didn't think I was gay. I hope I didn't, they didn't think I was effeminate, you know, and be all racked about that. The time, the day I let that go is when I started working more. And it's when, because I had the courage, because of what my parents allowed me to do, and I've been a caregiver for 21 years. So it's like, I was blessed to do all of that, but because I was allowed to pursue my career, once I made myself relax and just be like, I love orange, I'm a feminine, this is what I do, I'm bigger than life, I'm flamboyant, I'm gay, um, I'm sissified, I can talk masculine and, and be that dude too. Once I, I wasn't scared anymore. I, I thought, Take me or leave me, like George Wolf, who I went to school with, college. With he was quoted years ago, and I always remembered this. He just said, "My credits are my credits," and it's like me. This is who I am. I'm fun loving. I'm honest. I'm on time. I'm articulate. I pronounce the R in the word door, um, and I I don't shy away from all of that stuff now. Yeah, I know. I think well, I when I look at what I look at you as saying basically, once I accepted myself fully and stopped having the fear enter my life, then of course your talent would shine through, and you're able to access more of your toolbox and your talent to book gigs. I feel like exactly. that's kind of what that is. it's like. It's kind of like the thing where you cut yourself off in spots. That means you're cutting off opportunity. So no one can really see you fully. They can't, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not able to go, there's something about him. I want to hire him. Because I noticed that a lot of things that I get hired for is because of personality, it's because how you make them feel. Um, there are 10,000 exactly. 10, black men who want to be actors. And so, so now it's like, which ones show up on time? Which ones are good on set? Which ones will know their lines? Which ones? make me smile when they enter the room. Exactly. Who's nice to the crew? Who's nice? Like, like it's all, I'm learning, I've been in business 15 years. I'm, I'm a baby compared to you being in business. But I just feel like that's what I learned in the 15 years. That's what they really want. You see folks who get booked all the time. You're like, how do they get booked all the time? Oh, I, I see what's going on. 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh, exactly. I mean, that's the thing about our society. We will survive with kindness. And there are plenty of people who are kind and generous that we try to surround ourselves with. I guess what I'm saying to you that as society has progressed more, it's harder sometimes to maintain that or to see that optimism because we're clouded with just so much ugly news. But to your point, who is fun to be with? Like when you and I started, we were both laughing and smiling. If we were doing a job together and either you were my director or I was, whatever capacity you're gonna be working with James Locke today, as soon as we saw each other, it's like, oh my God, you're gonna be fun to work with. You know, if one of us were like, okay, well, okay, let's go. You'd be like, girl, yeah. what is that about? <laughs> You'd yes. be like, Dominic, excuse me, say what now? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, right, exactly, exactly. Well, exactly, that's it. And I have worked on sets where they're like, we saw your name on the call sheet, we're so happy. Like, I, I had friends, I worked on certain shows, they're like, we saw your name, we were so excited, he's coming in, like, when are you coming in? I mean, that is a great compliment. I didn't, I, I just didn't realize that. And so I started working because folks it's at home, a lot of stuff is hurry up and wait. A lot of stuff is you're sitting around. The acting portion happens, but it's mostly sitting around. Right, exactly. Uh, yes. And shooting the breeze and hanging out with each other and whatever, learning your lines or whatever. So it's like, you want to be with, around people who are pleasant at the very least. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but like I said, we're human beings, James. We all like that. I mean, yeah. everybody that has sense likes that. You know, it's like why you hold the door for somebody or, or, or say to the checkout lady, oh, your hair looks nice today. You know, whatever that kind of is. It, it, we all like to feel good, you know, and when you can do that for people, you know, like you said before we went on air, I love my job. I love doing what I get to do. And it's that kind of enthusiasm that makes life go around, else we'd be walking around despondent. You know, you and I are, are sitting here laughing and talking, and we are still in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th there's still things going on that we have to be in tune with, but we have found a way to maneuver through that and still maintain our positivity around us as much as we can. Yeah. Well, I talk to you forever and the time went by fast. I mean, wait, so, I mean it's, it's just like, I'm like, you're like, go by fast, so you have to come back on. Just have to come oh, back. Well, James, absolutely. Like I said, we're gonna run into each other at CVS, you know, when I'm getting that rotisserie chicken, okay? It'll be like, <laughs> when we're both reaching for the rotisserie chicken at the same time, <laughs> okay, Costco, it's $4.99 and it is the bomb. That chicken is the bomb. That chicken. Was, yes, oh, I love it. Yeah. Well, okay. I want to I want to thank you uh for again for having me on because you have a lot of people. You mentioned 10,000 black men. So I'm glad that I was one of them. That I got to be on your show today, you know, because we are moving things forward. We are. And it's called Brothers of the Desert, Brothers Got Talent. It's, uh, it's Saturday, May 21st from 638 p.m. at the Palm Springs Cultural Center. I will put the link down below for okay. you guys to go and check it out. Um, Ralph Cole Jr., the man here. I'm James Lott Jr. Um, and we will see you next time here on Extra Connections here on JLJ Media Support Black art and artists and queer artists and Black queer artists and Black queer men lives matter. See you next time. Bye-bye.